Ching. Welcome back to Whiteboard Science. First of all, let me tell you, it is an honor and indeed a privilege that you would even take the time to come into my channel and watch any of my videos. So I, I, I definitely see it as a, as a privilege. So welcome back to Whiteboard Science. We have our dry erase markers, our dry erase eraser, and of course, our whiteboard. So our goal, as always, is to teach you something that you can go forth, whether you're young or old, interested in science or not. The goal is that you can learn a little something, go forth in life, and then when you experience something in life that has anything to do with what we talk about, you can tell yourself, I know how that works, or I know that why that is. I know why plants are green. I know why the sun does what it does, etc. So that's our goal here. And the other part of that goal is to do it relatively quickly. Uh, no hour and a half long videos. This isn't a college lecture, just real quick and dirty so that you can go out and next time you look up, for example, today at the sun, you'll have an idea of what's going on. So today we're going to talk about the sun. And we're going to answer this question, a question that I had had for a real long time as a kid, and because I learned that it was a big ball of burning gas. And so then I asked myself, well, if that's the case, then how come it's still there? Why was it burning yesterday? Why is it burning today? And why do I know that when I wake up tomorrow, it will be burning tomorrow? Because if it's a big ball of gas, shouldn't it just explode and all burn at once and disappear? I mean, heaven forbid, if I've got a propane bottle out there at the grill and it's got a leak and I get a big ball, a big cloud of propane gas kind of floating across the porch, somebody goes out there and lights up a cigarette, well, that thing is going to light off. In fact, it's, the whole thing's going to burn. It's probably going to do so rapidly enough to create an explosion. But it ain't going to just burn right here and then it's just sitting around, float around. No, the whole thing, whoom! Is going to burn up. If I'm putting gasoline into the gas can, I'm sorry, into the, uh, yeah, the gas can at the gas station, or if I'm pouring it into the lawnmower and I make a little spill right here and some guy comes along with a match, lights that off, whew, the whole thing's going to light off, right? All of that fuel is going to burn and light off and go away very quickly because all of it's burning. But the sun doesn't do that. So why is that? There's got to be something else going on, something more happening than what we're aware of that allows the sun to burn for a long time before we were ever around several billion years and it will burn for another about four billion years so how is that well there's two answers to that question and i'm going to address them both one generally speaking is the sun's not burning when we burn something we take a lighter to it we take a match to it and there's a chemical reaction that takes place that changes the arrangement of the atoms of whatever it is we were burning wood paper gasoline and out pops a new chemical, and there's energy given off, and that comes in as heat and light, and that's where combustion comes from when we think about burning. But that's not what's happening with the sun. The other answer to the question is, that, you know, why does the sun continue to burn and burn forever, and, and well, for a very long time anyway, is that it's not really burning, per se, much like if I were to light something on fire. And those two things are very important to understanding why the sun is gonna have a very, very long lifetime. And I'm glad because we probably obviously would not be here if that were not the case. So let's talk about the first part, that the sun, not all of it is actually burning. So if I take the sun, and again, I'm not here to be an artist, but if that's the sun, all of the burning, and we're going to talk about that term later, is taking place only in a very, 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 very small part of the sun called its core. And in fact, it's so small that it only consists of one and a half percent, roughly, of the entire volume of the sun. So as big as the sun is, what's happening in its core, it's only happening within one and a half percent of its volume. That's where the burning is taking place. So what's happening to the rest of this then, stuff here? Well, it is indeed gas, like we thought it was, but it's glowing. That's all that's happening. The energy given off by the burning in the core is coming out and it's taken the shape of subatomic particles, mostly photons, and they're coming out with so much energy that they're hitting the atoms of the gas in the rest of the sun here, causing them to get real excited and atoms do not like to be excited. So they always try to seek their less excited mode and we call that the ground state. But when they do that, they give off of a photon also. And that photon hits another atom and eventually that little photon escapes the sun and then hits us and keeps us warm on a beach on a sunny day and we get a little bit of a tan perhaps and we can read a book at the park because of that photon of light that escaped the surface of the sun. But the point is all of this is glowing. Typically when you put a lot of energy into the atoms of something, it doesn't like it and it will give that energy off. 
A great example is a light bulb. And we're going to have another video that talks about how light bulbs work. But light bulbs typically consist of an in of a tungsten filament here, and we put electricity through it, and the tungsten doesn't like it. It wants to resist it. And the atoms of the tungsten give off photons that we see as light and can feel as heat in the infrared spectrum. So that's what's happening in the sun. And that answers, that's one of the two answers is into why does the sun always burn and it'll be there tomorrow, it was there yesterday, is because m most of the sun is not burning, it is glowing. What's so interesting too about the core of the sun, granted it's only a one and a half percent of its volume, but of all the gas mass of the sun, because this core is so densely packed, about 50% of everything in the sun is in that tiny little area right there. And we'll talk about why that's important here in a second. So that's part one of the answer, and that is most of the sun is not burning, only a very, very small part of it, and the rest of it is just glowing. So much like a candle, a big old candle right here with a little bit of a wick, and here's the flame coming off the candle. Well, this is all fuel, just like this is all fuel for the sun, but not all of it's burning just a little bit where the heat is touching the melted wax, turning it into a gas, and then it's burning right here. The rest of this is just for later use. Same thing here. There's only a little bit of burning taking place in a very, very small part of the sun, and the rest of it there is just glowing or fuel for later use, kind of like a candle. The other answer to the question is this. That burning word. When we burn something, it's a chemical reaction. And chemical reactions involve the swapping or rearrangements of the electrons. If we have an atom with a nucleus, that's an N. And electrons, when we get rid of or add or share, join electrons. Here are two electrons being shared by these two atoms. That is a chemical reaction. And if it's an exothermic reaction, that means energy is given off. So like when we burn something, and that's called combustion, let's say, for example, we're burning wood, which is made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, called cellulose. When we take a match to that wood, the heat from the match is enough to cause these guys to split apart. That's a chemical reaction. So now I got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen just kind of floating around. But then there's oxygen in the air, and oxygen does not like to be lonely, by the way. It's a very, very interesting element. It comes in here and goes, whoa, I want to join up with these guys. So it joins up with some carbon and makes CO2. It joins up with some hydrogen and makes water. And then we end up sometimes with some carbon monoxide. And then there's also some energy given off. And we see that in, in the form of light and feel it in the form of heat. This is a chemical reaction. And that is burning. Well, what's happening in the core of the star is nothing like that. It is not a chemical reaction. It is not burning. What's happening in the core of our sun is what's called a nuclear reaction. Nuclear reaction. I will spell that out there, reaction. So what does that mean? Well, if you watch one of our other videos where we talk about what is an atom, we know that atoms consist of electrons that are orbiting, if that's the way you want to look at, a nucleus. And in the nucleus, we've got some protons and we've got some neutrons, which I've got as two P's and two N's right here. One, two, three, four, five. Maybe I'll add some more protons to give this atom balance here. Well, what's happening in a nuclear reaction is that the nucleus, which is what the center of an atom is called, is somehow being arranged and or affected. Hence the term nuclear reaction because we're affecting the nucleus of this atom. Normally when you have atoms, in fact, I'm not even going to, I'm just going to draw it like this. They're being pushed around when they come in contact with each other, they just kind of bounce off one another. Much like if I take the south end of two bar magnets and try to touch them together, those magnets are going to repel one another. There's a repulsive force in there. Well, electrons have a negative charge, and when you try to push together like charges, whether these were you know, plus 10 or minus 1, it doesn't matter, they will repel each other just like the south ends of two bar magnets. So these atoms get here and they go, oh, no, dude, not going to happen. They repel one another. And I'm glad that happens. Why? Because that repulsion is why I can't put my fingers through this whiteboard right now. The electrons, the negative charge of the electrons that make up the atoms of my fingertip are preventing the atoms of my fingertip from mixing with, merging with, joining with the atoms that make up this whiteboard. 
or the rubber that's touching the concrete on your family car. Isn't that great? Or the atoms of air going across a wing that's producing lift to keep an airplane airborne. Thank goodness these electrons repel each other and don't let the insides, the nuclei, the nucleuses, whatever term you want to use, of these atoms join together. Because this world would be crazy, to say the least. Well, in the core of a star, like our sun, the story is very different. Have you ever played dog pile? We used to as a kid. Or man, tackle the man with the ball. You know, you're running across the yard and all, you know, you got 20 friends over there. Whoever's got the ball, they're going to get piled on, right? So you're down there in the bottom holding on to this ball and you got 15 of your best friends on top of you. Well, guess what happens, man? You're hot, you're squeezed, you can't even move your arms. That's kind of like what's happening in the core of a sun or I'm sorry, a star like our sun. In the core, gravity is pushing inwards from all directions. And so all this hydrogen that makes up our sun, by the way, the sun is made up mostly hydrogen. This elemental symbol for that is H and helium. And there's some other stuff in there. The symbol for helium is HE. There's some other stuff in there we'll talk about, it, but it's primarily hydrogen. Older stars, it's got less hydrogen and more other stuff. But this hydrogen is being squeezed together like you cannot imagine. And in fact, it's so hot in the core of a sun, of our sun, about 10 million degrees in our core, that the normal electrons that orbit around a hydrogen atom are stripped. They're just ripped off because there's so much energy in the core from this heat and pressure, those electrons can't even hang out. So all you end up with now is just the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, which is a proton. We'll draw that as a P. Now these have a positive charge. So if I have another proton over here with a positive charge, when they try to merge and get close to each other, uh-uh, it ain't gonna happen, just like we showed with our barb magnets. But because the pressure is so great, the squeeze between these two uh, atoms, hydrogen atoms, is so great, and it's so hot, when something is hot, its atoms or molecules are moving around very fast. Because if I take, for example, two tomatoes and I just kind of touch them together, they're not going to smash and join into one big tomato, right? But if I throw them at each other with enough energy, they'll merge, they'll squish, and whatever was in tomato one is going to mix with whatever was in tomato two. Same thing here. So if I squeeze them tight enough and throw them together, strong, you know, with enough strength, they will actually merge together and form a whole new element. Anytime we do anything, let me draw an atom here. There's a couple electrons and here's the nucleus. Anytime we make changes to the nucleus, the number of protons to the nucleus of an, of an atom, we create a whole new element. And that's what's happening in the core of our sun. Specifically with regards to hydrogen, we are squeezing together four hydrogens, and we'll put a little plus symbol here, to produce one helium atom. And that's what's happening. In fact, this because hydrogen nuclei are just protons, this is oftentimes called the proton, proton, if I can spell it, proton-proton reaction. And it is a nuclear reaction because we're talking about of changing the nuclei, the, some people say nucleuses, the nuclei of these atoms. If I could take this hydrogen and put it on a scale and weigh it, it would end up with some particular weight or if I could measure its mass, it's got some particular mass M. Well, guess what? This helium atom ought to be the same mass, right? Turns out they are not equal. In fact, this mass of these four hydrogens is a little bit greater than that of this helium. So where did that mass go? Well, it was converted directly into energy. Several different forms of energy. Ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays right off the get-go. In fact, it's a gamma ray that's released from that reaction. That gamma ray is weakened on its way out of the star. In fact, it takes 10 million years for a gamma ray to, on average, 10 million years for a gamma ray photon to eventually exit the surface of our sun. Larger stars takes even longer. And by the time it's bounced into so many different other atoms, it's lost a lot of energy. So that by the time it exits out, it may just be a very weak infrared photon. All you do is feel a little bit of heat, right? May be very, very energetic, still with a lot of energy because it got out of here pretty quick, i.e. an X-ray. Or it could just be kind of a run of the mill, everyday normal photon that we see as yellow light. And for example, you will see that if you look 
towards, notice I didn't say look at the sun. We never want to do that with our naked eye. But if you look towards the sun, you'll, you'll probably see through peripheral vision that it's kind of a yellowish color, particularly orange-like yellow-ish when it's near the horizon. So that's what's happening in the core of our sun. It's not a burning like when we burn paper or burn wood. It is a nuclear reaction involving four hydrogen atoms that are merged together, and we call it, they're fused together. In fact, we call that fusion, F-U-S-I-O-N. We're fusing four hydrogen atoms together to form helium. There's some mass that's lost in that nuclear reaction, and it just so happens that that mass is converted or given off in the form of energy. And thank goodness, because again, we wouldn't have plants that produce food for us to eat, for plant eaters to eat, and then for us to eat the meat eaters, the plant eaters, and, and, and whatnot. What's interesting, too, about the core of this, of our sun, for example, the pressure, like I said, it's 10 million degrees, which is the temperature that's needed to fuse hydrogen together to form helium, but the pressure is unbelievable, too, as well. In fact, did you know air is pressing down on you? If you're on the beach, you know, in Cabo San Lucas, hanging out, catching a tan, and enjoying the waves, the air is, of our atmosphere is pressing down on you, and we call that one atmosphere, one ATM, typically is what we call it. It's about 14 pounds per square inch. Well, the pressure in the core of the sun is about 300 million times <laughs> more than that. Unbelievable. And it's very, very dense. Can you imagine that, I believe that the core of our star is about 12 times more dense than lead, and lead is very dense. And it's made, by the way, lead's made of hard stuff. This is, this is gas, it's hydrogen gas, and yes, it's, yet it's so compressed that it's 12 times more dense than lead. It's about 10 million degrees in the core with a pressure of about 300 million times what you are experiencing if you're just sitting at the beach down in Mexico. Also, a little interesting factoid, this reaction that's taking place here, four hydrogens, and I'm just going to draw four H's that produce one helium, produces a little bit of energy, just a little bit. And in fact, this one nuclear reaction produces enough energy, and I'm going to just draw a little fly here, a little housefly sitting on the table. It's only enough energy to raise a housefly about one one-thousandth of an inch off a coffee table. That ain't much at all, is it? That's very little energy. But the point is this. You know how many times this is happening every second in the core of our sun? 10 to the 38. That is a 10 with 30, and I'm not going to draw them all. 38, you can do it on paper. 38 zeros, a lot of zeros per second. So in the time it took me just to write this out, a lot of houseflies could have been risen, right? Or raised off that coffee table. Again, I'm not a master of English, or actually not much of anything, but conveying to you what I do know. So it happens a lot. I think about six, uh, six million three hundred thousand tons. One ton is 2,000 pounds, so just double that and get your pounds. Metric tons, if you will, is uh, burn of hydrogen. By the way, I'm going to use the term burning, even though it's not combustion. Scientists will also say hydrogen burning, helium burning, oxygen burning, silicon burning. When we talk about the nuclear reactions in, in a star, just know that it's not the normal chemical reaction burning that you see at your fireplace or when you're burning uh, paper if you're at a campfire or even if you light off a firecracker, that's burning. It occurs very rapidly and gives off a lot of energy. But about 6,300,000 tons of hydrogen is converted into helium every second. And the amount of helium that's produced every second is 600, I'm sorry, 6,250,000. So if you notice, there's a difference here, 50,000 tons per second that's missing. And what happened to that mass? We talked about it earlier. It's all converted into energy. That is amazing. So count the one, stop. That's how much hydrogen got burned. That's how much helium got produced. This is what's left over, and that's how much energy got produced. And in fact, you've probably heard of this equation. It's very famous, and a lot of people know it, but they don't know what it means. E equals mc squared says that the amount of energy potentially inside a nuclear energy, by the way, in a given element, if you will, or any, anything that has mass is equivalent to its mass times the speed of light 
I'm just gonna, it's, which is C squared. Speed of light is very, very, very large number. And if I square it, it's even much, much bigger. And that tells you even something as small as a paper clip with a little bit of mass has a lot of potential energy in it if we can tap into it. And that's how we get nuclear weapons. That's how we get nuclear power. And that's how we get nuclear powered spaceships. And that's how we get um, um, radioactive decay and, and all that. That's where that comes from, if you will. So it's pretty interesting how that works. Eventually, if the sun is made up of all hydrogen and we begin to run out of hydrogen, what happens? Well, we talked about how there's gravitational forces pulling inward, but there's also forces. In fact, I'm going to draw the gravity vector up top here. There's also forces coming out of the sun in the form of that energy that's coming from the core that we talked about earlier. And normally these two, if I draw them the same length, are in balance. Gravity equals radiant forces. That's a G. Everything is in balance, and thank goodness our sun not only has been in balance for a very, very long time, which has brought forth life and allows us to be here, it's in balance today, so I can do this video, and it'll be in balance four billion years from now. This is in balance. But as we run out of hydrogen, as our gas tank gets empty, this radiant force becomes a little weaker, only to about right here. So what happens? Well, gravity is still there, so it begins to squeeze the sun into a smaller ball. And if we squeeze the sun more than what it was before, what happens inside the core? Well, it gets squeezed more than what it was before. And all this helium that says, hey guys, I really don't feel like mixing our contents together because of the repulsive forces of the protons inside the nucleus. Suddenly now these heliums are even squeezed together with enough energy and enough force for their nuclei to merge together. And now we have a nuclear reaction involving helium and scientists call that helium burning. So we have hydrogen burning, now we got helium burning. And remember, it's not burning like we burn paper, it's a nuclear reaction. So now we have helium that's merging at the core of our star. And suddenly when that happens, the radiant forces go up to counter the gravitational forces coming in and now suddenly our star is in balance again. And you never, it doesn't just do this, it's a gradual change from one of the, to the other. And now we have helium that's merging. And what it looks like is that we have a helium here and a helium here. There's a nuclear reaction to form what's called beryllium. And then out here, there's another helium that mixes with this beryllium. I say mixes, it's a nuclear reaction. And then we end up coming over here with carbon that's formed. It's funny because helium nuclei are also known as alpha particles. So the nickname for this nuclear reaction is called the triple alpha process or nuclear reaction. Why? Because there are three helium atoms involved in that and helium atoms in the sun because their electrons are stripped away actually just consist of helium nuclei which are the same as alpha particles so they don't call it the triple helium process for some reason or the triple helium nuclei process they just call it the triple alpha process for that there's another process out there called the cno also that produces and there's a whole bunch of them in the sun and in fact this helium burning that I talked about inside the sun is just one of several steps. So we have hydrogen that burns and then in helium that burns that forms carbon. Then you end up with carbon that fuses into neon that I can also fuse into sodium that also fuses into oxygen. And then you have all these by themselves in different reactions of fusing into heavier elements. So when we started off with the heavy, I'm sorry, the lightest element in the universe within the core of a star, that stuff, I'm sorry, I drew an HE, hydrogen, the lightest element, try to do it again, in the universe is converted into helium and helium is converted into carbon and carbon is into neon and silicon and oxygen and then we end up with some magnesium in here and then sulfur comes in here and we had some silicon also and later on in the process and then we eventually end up with some nickel and all of this eventually leads into the production of what's called iron and its elemental symbol is Fe, but something strange happens. The amount of energy needed to merge two iron atoms together is greater than the energy released from those two atoms merging together. 
which means the reaction stops. Reactions have to be self-sustaining. If I light a piece of paper on fire, step back and expect that paper to continue to burn, it has to be a self-sustaining chemical reaction. Well, this is a non-self-sustaining nuclear reaction. And in fact, the instant that suns begin to attempt to do this, stars, I'm sorry, or, or suns, you can call them suns, begin to attempt to do this, that marks the, a very rapid death, if you will, of that star. So no elements greater than iron are manufactured within the core of stars. You know, a guy named Carl Sagan said that we are all made of star stuff. Remember when I talked about how helium all comes together in the triple alpha process to form carbon? You know, you're made of carbon, a lot of it, by the way. In fact, almost all living creatures have carbon in them. Well, carbon just doesn't exist naturally by itself, right? It had to be made somewhere, and guess where it was made? In the core of stars and of course none of the carbon inside our sun has been ejected out into the universe it's still in the sun so where did this carbon come from well it came from stars that were exploding either novas or supernovas and that carbon and everything else created inside a star was pushed out into the into the universe to eventually form all the different things we see today iron aluminum nickel plants people your pencil, this dry erase marker, everything here that is non-hydrogen and a little bit of helium, everything else was manufactured in the core of stars. And Carl Sagan said himself, we are all made of star stuff. Pretty interesting thing there. So, and by the way, everything, heck, because there are some elements heavier than iron, right? We've got, there's our Fe, we got uranium, we got plutonium, we got platinum, I can't remember the symbol for platinum. You've got gold, which is AU. You've got silver, which is AG. Well, these are all heavier than iron, so where were these made then if they weren't made in the core of the star? Well, when some stars, if they're big enough, like really, really big stars, and I'll draw a big star kind of small here, if it's big enough, it will explode into a, one of the largest explosions known in the entire universe called a supernova. And all these heavier, heavy elements, uh, I'm sorry, elements, lighter than iron to include iron, all are pushed out in, in the shock waves of this explosion, the pressure of this shock wave and the force and the energy released so quickly is great enough to actually fuse the iron together to form all the other heavier elements. In fact, all your heavy elements, and I just listed a bunch of them here, are made inside the shell of an expanding explosion called a supernova. And supernovas don't happen very often at all. In fact, most stars do not explode in a supernova. They either just kind of poof away quietly into a white dwarf or they do explode into a kind of a small explosion called a nova. But most do not do um, in their lives as supernovas. So something like this gold ring on my finger is actually very, very rare. This gold was not made on this earth. It was not made in our solar system and it didn't come from and is not going to be made in our star because our star, our sun is too small to, be a, to, to die from a supernova. This gold was made in the explosion of a star who knows where out there in the universe. And what's even more interesting that the gold that makes up this ring may not have even come from the same star. <coughs> Which is why I find, honestly, gold a little bit more interesting than diamonds. Diamonds were made, except for the carbon, you know, diamonds are carbon. Diamonds were made here on our earth, so they are earthly. But gold was made in the explosion of a gigantic star billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of years, or sorry, of miles away from us and a very long time ago, which to me makes gold a little bit more unique than diamonds. But that's my argument for a gold ring instead of a diamond ring. <laughs> and you can take that to the bank, right? So, folks, again, our goal is to be quick and dirty. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about why the sun has been burning. Remember, burning, nuclear burning for a very long time. And will continue to go for about another 4 billion years. Thank you for watching Whiteboard Science. If you liked what you watched, please subscribe. If you have any kind of questions or comments, put them in the comments down below the video. Make sure that you don't put it on a thread of a thread of a thread of a thread, unless it applies to that thread. If you have a question that you want me to see as quickly as possible, just put it at the top of the, of the question column there, and I will see it and get to it as rapidly as feasibly possible. Hope you all enjoyed. Please subscribe. Have a good day. Bye.